aging reactors, energy prices, disasters. Nuclear power has been falling out of favor in the U.S. for decades. But the conversation is changing. The intensifying threat of global warming and the explosion of AI is boosting the outlook of nuclear energy. This is an inflection point. But we will get to the point that by 2050 we have zero emissions. More than 100 nations have set lofty net zero targets, forcing the world to weigh the inherent risks and high cost of atomic power, which has no carbon emissions. That includes the United States. The climate change moment is upon us now, and we need to meet that moment today and decarbonize our grid. Solar power, wind power, battery storage, they should go as fast as they physically can. And even that's not gonna be fast enough. So now we need to complement it with other tools like nuclear power. When you start talking about decarbonizing our economy by 2050, you realize that's a huge challenge. You really need all of those technologies to come together to meet those kinds of goals. I think nuclear plays a very significant role in fighting climate change. It is already the largest source of clean electricity, and I think it'll continue to grow in that area. If the United States wants to revive its nuclear industry, it will take a panoramic effort. That includes maintaining aging reactors, building new ones, and fostering various startups. But the country faces a gauntlet of issues in order to convert that enthusiasm into results. The U.S. first commercialized nuclear fission energy in the 1950s. It was a remarkable feat of engineering to capture energy created by splitting uranium. Most of the plants, they started building them in the late 60s and into the 1970s. At its peak, we had 112 operating nuclear reactors. And in 1979, we had the Three Mile Island nuclear accident and the U.S. nuclear industry pretty much ground to a halt. Three Mile Island caused widespread panic at the time. And though the crisis is now declared over, it's left a question mark over the whole future of the American power industry. We saw 13 reactors shut down from 2013 to 2022, mostly for economic reasons, because nuclear power plants, they're expensive to operate. And natural gas was becoming cheaper. Wind and solar were becoming more common and cheaper. Today, the U.S. has 94 operating reactors, generating around 20% of the country's electricity. If the U.S. wants to increase its nuclear power output, the first step is maintaining or even reopening aging reactors. Oconee Nuclear Station in South Carolina was part of that first wave of nuclear plants. Its first reactor began operation in 1973. The Yoconi plant in South Carolina, for a long time, was the biggest nuclear power plant in the United States. It's your standard light water reactor that's the conventional model that we're using in all of the power plants in the United States today. Nuclear power plants in the U.S. get licensed for 40 years. When they started building them in the 60s and 70s, that was kind of the expectation. Let's take them for 40 years and see what happens after that. Most of them have now been extended even longer than that. Today, utility companies are investing in their nuclear plants like Oconee so they can run for 80 years and maybe even longer. But back in the early 2010s, that wasn't the case. The industry was beleaguered by competition from cheaper natural gas and renewable wind and solar and rattled by the disaster at Fukushima. No one was fighting to keep an old nuclear plant open. While we were seeing all of these plants close, the other side of the coin is that we weren't seeing any new construction of new power plants either. President George W. Bush launched the Nuclear Power 2010 program as a response to that downturn. Only two utilities heeded his call, and one of them reached the finish line. Southern Company completed their expansion of Vogel in early 2024 with reactors three and four, but it came in seven years behind schedule and more than double its $14 billion budget. Meanwhile, dozens of nuclear reactors were shelved by investors who faced ballooning budgets. It's remarkable that two reactors were completed at the Vogel site they might be the last large reactors built in the U.S. for a long time. So the construction certainly did have challenges. This was a first of a kind nuclear unit in the United States. We had to restart a supply chain, retrain workers on the specifics of nuclear construction. And then an unforeseen global pandemic occurred. Our primary contractor filed bankruptcy. So certainly these were challenges 
some of which we expected, some of which we didn't, but we navigated them. I think it's absolutely a monumental accomplishment and it's so important to prove that building nuclear power in the United States is possible. And I do hope that other utilities and companies in the country as well as around the world will continue to benefit from the lessons learned from Vogel 3 and 4 and build more nuclear generation. There's a lot of interest in whether we can build another one of these big nuclear power plants in the United States. But the utilities, they're the ones who would have to write the check. And they are not lining up to take on one of these projects. They're wary of a price tag that would be in the tens of billions of dollars. If Vogel is the last big nuclear reactor built in the United States, startups are trying to fill in the gap. They are developing new, smaller reactor designs for the next generation of the country's nuclear fleet. They called SMRs, that's a small modular reactor. The basic idea is that you mass produce the components in a factory and then you can put them on a truck or put them on a barge and deliver them to the site where it's all bolted together. So that's supposed to be faster, easier, and most importantly, cheaper. Kairos is one of at least a dozen companies that are developing new reactor technologies. They're developing a completely different technology. It uses molten fluoride salt as a coolant instead of water. But the key is that they can build them in a factory and send them out to wherever they need to be installed. The next step for Kairos is going to be at Oak Ridge Labs in Tennessee, where they're going to build their first test reactor. Experts predict we'll have a functioning small modular reactor by the mid-2030s. Bill Gates recently announced TerraPower, a startup he founded, broke ground for its first commercial reactor in Wyoming. A leading project from NuScale was terminated in late 2023, a victim of inflation and elevated interest rates. The U.S. government is vital to the success and potential growth of the nuclear industry. Its support in approval licenses and funding is the only way these projects ever reach the finish line. Looking forward to the new administration, Republicans have generally supported nuclear energy, but President-elect Donald Trump has given mixed signals. These things ended up costing $25 billion, and they, one of them never got opened. So it's been an extraordinary change from when I grew up in small town Sterling, Illinois, to, you know, really seeing this renaissance of interest especially for someone who's been in the industry for a while, because we went through this period, 2009, 2010, where the nuclear renaissance phrase got thrown around a lot. And it didn't come to fruition at that point in time. But I will say I am very optimistic. So whether it is our involvement with the Vogel nuclear plant and seeing that all the way through, or restarting nuclear power plants, or building new nuclear power plants using next generation technologies, I think we end up being a sounding board for the entire nuclear industry. Today, I would say nuclear power has just as much support as every other clean technology. We need to get to a place where independent power producers in deregulated states can build a reactor. The Loan Programs Office really is here to serve folks who decide to try to borrow money from our office. But ultimately, the decision around whether we're actually in a nuclear renaissance is the decision of the utility companies and others who have to come to us for a loan. It's difficult to predict if the refound enthusiasm for nuclear power will be matched by utilities and entrepreneurs. The demand for carbon-free electricity is increasing, but it's difficult to stomach a multi-billion dollar bill and decades-long timetable for a nuclear reactor. Experts say the upswing in nuclear power plant construction needs to continue to both meet net zero emissions goals by 2050 and ultimately to help smooth the world's transition to renewable energy. So even with all the excitement for nuclear energy these days, there are still some important environmental groups like Sierra Club, Greenpeace. They are staunchly opposed to nuclear energy. They're still concerned about all of the risks. Nuclear power and radioactive waste are inherently dangerous. The risks of atomic reactor meltdowns are radioactivity escaping into the environment to contaminate the drinking water supply, contaminate the food supply, contaminate the air that you breathe. And it's been known for decades that any exposure to ionizing radioactivity 
no matter how small the dose, carries a risk of cancer causation. Our movement across the country and across the world supports renewables complemented by efficiency and storage. That covers the reliability aspect. In fact, internationally and in the United States, renewables like wind and solar are growing by leaps and bounds, where the nuclear power industry has enjoyed the lion's share of subsidies. So when I started writing about nuclear energy in 2019, the only real story was which reactor was going to get shut down next because they were so expensive to operate. But today the narrative has completely reversed. Now the story is who's going to extend their license for another 20 years? Who's going to be the first to build another big nuclear power plant? There's been a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of cheerleading in the nuclear power industry. What the country needs to do is to stop, build a reactor, and generate electricity. There is a real regulatory and social and political gauntlet that nuclear power plant developers need to run through. I remain optimistic about nuclear power, but it's taking much longer than I had expected. And I'm concerned about rising costs due to inflation and high interest rates. What I see happening in the next five years is the reopening of, of several retired nuclear power plants, perhaps three. And after 2030, I anticipate that we'll start to see some of the advanced and small module reactors coming online. Right now, most of the interest in the nuclear space surrounds fission, but one cannot disregard all the companies that have raised about $7.1 billion to commercialize fusion. Fusion offers a very, very promising solution as well and that could be an additional nuclear technology that contributes to address challenges of climate change.